Old Testament survey. If you were not expecting to go to Old Testament survey class today, then you're in the wrong place. Um, you know, I always love when they say, if you're not planning to go to Phoenix, Arizona, then you need to be playing now, right? <laughs> so, um, today we are talking about the former prophets, and I want to get into that a little bit. We'll be talking about Joshua Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. And those of you who know your Old Testament will immediately say, wait a minute, there's something missing in the middle of that. Yeah. Our Bible is lined up in terms of Joshua Judges Ruth, which is my mother's name, so I like the book of Ruth. It's a wonderful story. 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. The traditional way that the English Bible is organized, uh, the Christian English Bible, I should say, is in terms of the Pentateuch, or the Torah, which we studied previously, the first five books, the books of Moses, and then the Christian Bibles tend to organize the second, or call the second set, or grouping of books, the historical books. That's not what the Jewish Bible calls it. The Jewish Bible then goes to the prophets, and they have the former prophets and the latter prophets. So I want to spend a little time talking about that. First, if the Christian system of organizing the, the books of the Bible categorizes those books as historical, then why is it that the Jewish Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, and you will all remember that Tanakh is a combination of the abbreviations for the three sections of the Hebrew Bible. There is the Torah, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writing. And they take those three words, Torah, Nevaim, and Ketuvim, abbreviate them to Tanakha, push them all together and get the, get the word Tanakh, which is the word that's used for the Hebrew Bible. Okay? So the Hebrew Tanakh, again, has the law, which we've studied, and nobody disagrees on that, the first five books, actually a few scholars do, I'll mention that later. And then the second section, according to the Hebrew Bible, are the prophets, starting with Joshua. So why is it that the Jewish Bible, or the Hebrew Bible, sees these books, today we're talking about Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st uh, and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings, why are they considered prophetic books instead of historical books? Well, I think the reason is because of a different understanding of what history is. Okay? Um, history, definition from Miriam Webster. History is a continuous, systematic narrative of past events, usually written as a chronological account. That's what we think of as history. And implied in that, history for us, is some level or some degree of objectivity that a good historian is a person who is able to capture the events that have occurred in a place and time uh, objectively. Well, this definition does not suit the Bible histories. It does not fit the Bible histories. The writing of history as we think of history, the Western concept of history, did not begin until the 5th century BC. At that time, a man named Herodotus, a Greek writer, wrote the history of the Persian Wars, Greece and Persia fighting each other. It was not until the 5th century that anybody started writing history the way we think of history, as being chronological, factual, dates, people, in order, objective. Prior to that, history, or chronicles as they frequently were called, were written much more with a sense of achieving a particular, uh, a particular goal, they were not seen as objective. They frequently were not chronological. In fact, one of the things that's frustrating for us, even as recently as the New Testament Gospels, is the fact that, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, even the three synoptic Gospels, they don't have things in the same order. If you try to line them up, they, they seem to jump around from each other because Hebrew writers, even as recently as the first century A.D., tended to think of writing things down in terms of putting things that related to one another next to each other, whether they occurred in, in chronological order or not. You see? They had a different approach. They, were, they thought a better way to get at the real root of things was to write things that were connected to each other, next to each other, not in chronological order. Herodotus is really the first writer who wrote history in a chronological, sequential, objective order. So in effect, he is called the, well, he is called the father of history and is widely considered to be the first true historian in a Western sense, in, in the sense we have, that ever existed. 
Scholars in the field of history will say that anything written before Herodotus is prehistoric. It's prehistory. Because while we may have written accounts of it, it is not history the way we understand it. Now, the books that we have, particularly today we're talking about Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, do record historical events. But they don't record them in, according to the definition we have of history, or the way that Herodotus wrote history as the father of history. Herodotus, 5th century BC, we're talking about writings that occurred um, 900 years before that. So almost a millennium before that were the writings we're talking about here. Depending on when they were written down between 400 and 1,000 years. All right? So... That is not in any way to diminish the books we're talking about. It's just so we have an understanding that these, you can't read these the same way you would read Bruce Catton or you know, some historian of modern events because they had different objectives. Particularly, whereas we call these historical books or we call these books of history in, a, in the Christian, the Western groupings, the Hebrews call them prophecy. Prophecy does not mean telling the future. It might include that. There are parts of Daniel, which is one of the pro he's one of the prophets. Actually, it comes in part of the writings. We'll talk about that later. But um, some of the prophets spoke about future events because God gave them a vision. And we've come to think that that's what prophecy is, is telling the future. And in a good sense, is telling the future because God gave you an understanding of the future. But that's not... The real definition of prophecy. Prophecy means to speak or write by divine inspiration. A prophet in the Old Testament was one who spoke a word from God for the people. Most often, it involved something that was happening right now. Most of the prophets of the Old Testament gave uh, an interpretation or an evaluation or even a condemnation of what was happening right now speaking for God, giving God's evaluation or, or view of what was happening. So prophecy to the Hebrews did not mean telling the future. It could include some historical events. And so the Hebrew Bible sees Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings as the former prophets, meaning they were early on. And for us, it's helpful to think in terms of the former prophets being more historical in their orientation, although not history by a western sense of history, and then the latter prophets, which is the next grouping of prophets in the Hebrew Tanakh, would be much more what we think of as prophets, where they are making declarations to the people on behalf of God, okay? Is that clear? Let me give you sort of a summary of that. The former prophets, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, do, do record historical events. But their purpose is not to write history as we understand it, but rather to record God's action in fulfilling His covenant promise, promises. They have a very specific goal they're trying to accomplish, and it's not just recording the historic facts. Their goal is to record God's actions in fulfilling His covenant promises. Because these books record God's actions perceived from that perspective, that is a divine perspective, the Jews understand them to be prophetic, which means to speak or write by divine inspiration. Perhaps the best way for us to understand these books is they are a, a record of historic events, but from a prophetic perspective. <coughs> All right, we're clear on that? And you understand now what history is from a biblical perspective as different than history from a Western cultural perspective, right? Any questions or comments about that? You guys are just too easy. Um, okay. That, I wanted to start out as we talk about the former prophets because they are the more historical, giving us a uh, record of historical events from a prophetic perspective. Next week when we talk about the latter prophets, the, one who spoke, the ones who spoke much more like a thus saith the Lord kind of prophecy, you don't read that very often in these books. Thus saith the Lord. But you've heard that expression. That comes with the latter prophets who were, who were responsible for declaring God's intention, His will, or even His judgment on the people. And so next week, we're going to start out with a discussion of the prophetic element in the prophets. 
what we usually think of as the prophetic element, as opposed to the historic element in th these books this week, the former prophets. Okay, Ana Rosa. Uh, this is a, too, a little late to ask this question, but I think it's very important for to explain to us about historical events, the way we see them, or the way they were seen by the Jews, because many people that you are trying to tell them about the Bible or something, they say, oh, but it doesn't coincide, you know, it doesn't have anything, it's not the same thing. Yeah. And I didn't know how to explain it. Why? Right. Why, you know? Well, and it's also true that the organization of the Bible, the, the English Bible particularly, we've said this before, is not, is not based upon when they were written, particularly the New Testament. Um, this is true for the Old Testament too. The, we, we talk about in the English Bible sometimes the major prophets and the minor prophets. And by the use of those words, it sort of implies that some of them are important yeah. and some of them are less important. No, the major prophets are longer and the minor prophets are shorter. That's all that means. And so they put all the major prophets in the, in the English Bible first, the long ones, and then the minor prophets, the shorter ones, come later. That's why all of the little prophets, the ones that are just you know a chapter or two, are all as you get toward the New Testament. The same thing is true in the New Testament. Like you get to the letters of Paul. You know, the first letter we have Paul from Paul is Romans. Romans is not the first letter that Paul wrote. It was probably either Galatians or 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> And yet, the reason we have them in the order we have is they put them in order of length. Romans being the longest of Paul's letters, and they work their way down to, you know, to Timothy and, and then Philemon, you know, at the, at the very end. So, um, it doesn't really make any sense, but it's what we've got. And to try to change that now with all of the Bibles that are in the world and how people have learned them and everything else would be like changing the metric system. It's possible, but nobody wants to do it. Um, so, that's why we, we have what we have. But it is important for people to understand that, um, that the order was sort of arbitrarily chosen. It's not historic. Now, the early books in the Bible, we believe that Genesis is one of the two oldest books, but Job is probably even older. Then, once we get to, from Exodus on, you do get into kind of a sequence of historical events until you get into the prophets, and then they kind of dance around, okay, in terms of when they occurred versus when they actually seem to appear in the Bible. Let me make another comment about history as well. I, I made this sort of uh, ethnocentric statement that Western history, ethnocentric means from the perspective of my, my culture, um, that Western history is written chronologically in advance and that there's implied, uh, an implied objectivity to it. Well, that ob objectivity is only implied. No historian can write a completely objective history. The only way you can write a completely objective history is that if you recorded every possible minutia of every event that occurred. Well, that's impossible. You can't do that. Which means, by definition, a historian has to decide what, what events, what activities, what particulars am I going to record? What, what's, what's important to me? If you talk, and different kinds of history have very different expectations. If you're talking to a political historian, somebody who's concerned about the political rise and fall of empires and kingdoms and nations, they're primarily going to be focused on the wealthy people because the wealthy people run the countries. And so who they married and what they did and who got assassinated, they don't have a concern about the slaves and the women and the children and the little people. Social historians, unlike political historians, are concerned about the little people. And their job is much harder, by the way, because they also don't write histories about the little people. That's why it's so important we have history. History is the study of the written accounts. Archaeology is the study of the stuff that people left behind. So any history that happens is almost always the history of the wealthy. It's the history of the rulers and of the nobility, and because nobody wrote any of the rest of that down. In fact, as recently as Charles Dickens, 19th century England, people thought Dickens was, at first, was horrible because he actually wrote books and stories about little people, poor people, people who were illiterate. And you know what? Because Charles Dickens wrote books about the little people, illiterate people decided to learn how to read so that they could read Charles Dickens' stories because they were the first time anybody had written about them. That's a fact. Literacy took a huge jump in England when Charles Dickens' stories started being available because he was the first one who bothered to write even fiction about people who weren't rich. So historians typically study the wealthy. 
But archaeologists, one of the great benefits we get from archaeology is everybody left stuff behind. You know, slaves, women, kids, everybody had stuff. They find children's toys, poor children's toys, made by hand, kind of stuff. Well, they were all made by hand, if it's very ancient, they didn't have factories then. But, but the idea is, that's why history and archaeology, history the study of written record, archaeology the study of material stuff that got left behind, why it's important that those two things fit together. Because they really do look at different aspects of what happened in the past. Okay? Have you ever thought about that? Well, what I was saying is, it's, it's an unfair statement for me to say, well, from a Western perspective, real, real Western history is written from an objective point of view, because no historian can really be objective. Everyone has to choose, what am I going to record, and what am I going to leave unrecorded? So you have to start with that expectation, and if you understand that, that that's true for historians writing right now, as much as it was for historians writing 3,400 years ago, then we, we are a little bit more patient when we, it doesn't seem like the writing back then was completely objective. No writing is objective. In fact, do you know what the Heisenberg principle is? Heisenberg was a physicist. And the Heisenberg principle particularly was created with relationship to the observation of uh, nuclear particles. You never know what you're going to learn in this class. But what Heisenberg proposed is that just by observing something, particularly uh, nuclear particles, just your act of observing them changes them. Just by observing, much less trying to record, you actually change what's going on. Well, the Heisenberg principle has come to be accepted as relevant to culture and to history and everything else. The very fact that we observe something and then we try to capture it in writing necessarily changes it, partly because we can't be fully objective. We decide what history was by deciding what part of it we're going to record so that future people read it. We change history every time a historian writes something down, because he or she now has decided what was important. And so everybody in the future thinks that's what was important, and they don't know that there may have been some other important stuff that didn't get written down. So just by observing, but also by, also by trying to record it, we actually change the past. We change history. There's no such thing as fully, completely objective history or completely objective observation. Even. Okay? Questions about that? Did they just blow your heads off? <laughs> You're all going to go back and look up the Heisenberg principle, right? Especially as related to, you know, nuclear particles. All right. I told you I love science. Uh, so, let's get started with the actual books that are the former prophets. The first one we want to look at, the first one in order, is the book of Joshua. We believe that Joshua was written by Joshua. It does not say that. The traditional understanding, the traditional um, attribution is to Joshua. Joshua was the assistant to uh, Moses. Joshua had been, Joshua was one, one of only two adult men who had been in slavery in Egypt who had been at the Exodus, who had gone through the 40 years in the desert, who, who saw God part the Red Sea, he and Caleb. And along the way, he, uh, Caleb and Joshua were two of the 12 spies that Moses sent into the land of Canaan to spy it out. When they came back, 10 of those 12 spies said, oh, there's no way. They're, they're fortified cities and there are giants in that land and they have huge armies. We can't possibly do this. We can't go there. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can, because God said we could. And with his power, we can do anything, including conquer the land of Canaan. Well, they got overruled. And that denial of God's call and of God's power to fulfill his promise to take them into Canaan was why they had to wander around in the desert until every one of the adult males, except Caleb and Joshua, had died. Because none of them would inherit the promised land because they didn't believe God really meant it when he promised it to them or that he could do it. So Joshua has more history than anybody else other than Caleb in the Israelites. When they are, we're at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses goes up on Mount Nebo, which is right next to the Jordan River on the eastern side of the Jordan River. He looks across to the Promised Land. He sees the land that God has promised, but Moses is not allowed to enter in because of the disobedience he committed. He also was 120 years old, so it's not like they cut him off short or anything. 
So Moses dies. Joshua leads the Israelites into the land that God has promised them. All right? Um, the book of Joshua is, the theme of it is the conquest of the promised land, which is the, and, and that's the first section, and then the assigning and settling of the tribes of Israel throughout that promised land once it was mostly conquered. Mostly conquered being operative here. That's very important. The purpose of this book is to show that God is faithful in keeping his covenant promises. He had promised this from Abraham on. He told Abraham, you will be a great people. And at that point, it was just Abram, an old man, and Sarai, his old wife. Well, he fulfilled that in creating the Hebrew people. And he had promised all along as well that he would give them a home. Uh, a, a land that they would return to from the very earliest, even before the Israelites went down to Egypt. God had promised that they would have this land eventually, a land flowing with milk and honey. Part of it is, part of it is rocks and desert. Okay? <laughs> but there are parts of it that are very fertile. The Levant, you remember I told you that, that the Fertile Crescent, which starts in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, there's a big crescent, a big curve, which is always green on the maps to show that it's fertile. And the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia, was very fertile because the rivers watered that, and that's where civilization grew up. But that curves around and actually then hugs the coast along what we now know of as Israel, because there are several plains, very fertile plains, along that area, what was called the Levant, where still today crops are, are abundant. But when the Israelites started to take the land of Canaan, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, they did not completely fulfill God's command to them for all sorts of reasons. And so they didn't even get the best part of the land out of the deal. They ended up mostly living on the rocky mountainous parts in the center. There's a ridge of mountains that go right through the middle of what we know as Israel. They ended up mostly there, and the Philistines and other peoples continued to control much of the area along the coast that was so fertile. Okay? Um, Joanne? Uh, so, but the purpose is to show that God is faithful to his promises. The outline, basically there are three sections to this book. First, the actual campaign, the military campaign to capture Canaan. That's the first 12 chapters. Then the distribution of the land, once they had gone so far in the capturing, they divided it up between the, the 12 tribes. All right. Then the final section, oh, and I, I say the 12 tribes, at this point, there were two, two of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, each were given full shares as a sign of the fact that Joseph was more than just one of the twelve. But the Levites, the priestly family, were not given land because they were allowed to, they were given cities they were responsible for, they were taken care of, but they weren't given land. And so you had um, twelve tribes minus Joseph, minus the Levites, plus two of Joseph's sons. So you come back up to the twelve. Right? Clear? Question? Yes. Uh, what was what was the history of the Canaanites that created God's anger to want them totally annihilated by the Israelites? Yeah, the issue of how could God have told the Israelites, kill them all? Which is what he did. Right? There's several reasons for that, I think. None of which sound right to us. There is no answer to that question that sounds fully acceptable or appropriate to our modern Western ears. Let's just say that right up front. But the reasons why God did this, I believe, is um, most of the peoples of the Canaanites were, were peoples that at various times had been so offensive to God in the past and in the present that God deemed that they were deserving of annihilation, particularly the Canaanite religions were the gods that they worshipped involved not only ritual prostitution, but um, child <coughs> sacrifice. These were horrible religions that the Canaanites practiced. In fact, one of the things that happens, well, that's the main, that's one reason. To me, that's one of the most important reasons, is they really did need, deserve to be wiped out as a people because of the way they acted. Is that a story that I missed in the Old Testament up until now? I have not found the 
the history of the Canaanites and their... Well, they don't go into a lot of that, but what we learn is when the Israelites are not fully obedient to God, and they actually do start picking up the Israelite religion, I'm going to give you a couple of verses in a minute, they start doing those horrible things. Child sacrifice was occurring in the time of Solomon because they began to worship the gods Chemosh and Molech. Uh, Solomon married people from these Canaanite tribes that are people. He married women from these Canaanite tribes, made them his wives, perhaps because groups of these people were still there and he was trying to keep them from rebelling against him. They weren't supposed to be there if the Israelites had been obedient in, in, in either killing them or driving them off. But they were still there. Solomon marries women from these tribes and ends up actually setting up worship places for these pagan gods, including places where children were being sacrificed in the time of Solomon. In fact, our whole sort of traditional concept of hell, fire and brimstone and this horrible, you know, the fires of hell kind of stuff, go back to the practice of having these sacrificial fires where children were being burned in the valley of Hinnom, which is right outside the wall of, of the old city of Jerusalem. You know, you've got, you've got the, uh, the valley, the Kidron Valley, which is on the east side of the wall of the ancient city, which is right at the foot of Mount of Olives. If you go out the east side of the, of the old city of Jerusalem, you go down through the Kidron Valley, and then you go up the, uh, the Mount of Olives. On the opposite side, which is not very far away, if you go out the city, there's another valley there, which is the Valley of Hinnom. That's where they practice child sacrifice. And the, the Israelites were doing that. And so one reason is because the people were deserving of judgment. The second reason was because God knew if any of those people remained and practiced these abominations of religions, the Israelites would pick them up. And that's exactly what happened. The third reason, and again, none of these reasons seem, re seem justified to us in terms of the annihilation of the people, but we fall back on the fact that God is God. You know, he knows better than we do. Um, he made them. They are in his hands. It's for him to decide. Um, the third reason is because in that time, especially, the, the, the truth, the viability, the reliability of a God was dependent upon whether or not the people who followed him were victorious. You know, they basically said, if, if we can whip you, then that proves our God is more powerful than your God. And the extent or the degree to which we are successful is a sign of just how much more powerful our God is over your God. And so the idea of not just winning a battle, but, but really annihilating these people who served these, these pagan gods, who were horrendous in their expectation, who were demons, I believe, was that God said, wipe them out. And so others would get the sense that this God that the Israelites worship, Yahweh, the one true God, that he is the God of power. And we have examples of that having that effect. Uh, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which we'll come to, when um, Nebuchadnezzar put a, a golden idol of himself up and told everybody to worship it, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were Jews, young Jewish men who had been brought into Babylon during the captivity, the Babylonian captivity, but they were still Jewish and they still worshipped the true God, when they refused to worship this golden idol, Nebuchadnezzar turned the furnace up, threw them in there, and then he said, what's going on? I see, it looks like four men in there because apparently an angel at least had been sent to provide them. Well, he called them out, they walked out unburnt, and this furnace was so hot that the soldiers that were sent to throw them in were killed, just getting close to enough to throw them in. They walked out unburnt, alive, unsinged. It says that their clothes were not singed or even smelled of smoke. The result is Nebuchadnezzar starts worshiping the one true God. And he says, anybody who doesn't worship or doesn't recognize the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is going to answer to me. Because he's just proven to me by the power that he showed that he is the true God. And so that was the way things worked in ancient times. If power was shown, then you believed that that God was true. And again, none of these sound okay to our ears. And, and ultimately we fall back on the fact, as Job was told, God knows what he's doing, we don't. God is the righteous judge. He is a God that has proven his love and his grace and his mercy. When we have instances where it doesn't appear like he's a loving or graceful or merciful God, we have to take that part on faith. But we see the bad results when they didn't obey him, too. Yes? Uh, 
Well, to me, so, what you are saying is so much resounding in my heart because it's been hard sometimes to read the Old Testament. Yeah. That the Hina and, and, and whatever more annihilation or whatever it is. And all that, from, and I know God is God and He has the right to do whatever and everything. I just thank so much God that He gives us Jesus Christ because this world it deserves annihilation. Yeah. And only because of the mercy and the blood of Jesus are we here. Right. It's true. I mean, annihilation, we, we can't complain too much because yeah, we deserve it. I mean, punishment is, is, is what we deserve. Ron? Right. Is it a good time to ask about the Palestinian covenant? When Mary and I came across that, and we're not too sure what it is. Well, the Palestinian covenant is, um, is the promise that Palestine would be given. It's the promised land. That's what it is. It's the promise that if you are obedient, you will inherit this land. The extent to which they were obedient, they did inherit part of it. The extent to which they, they were disobedient, they did not inherit all of it. And that really is affirmed in Solomon. And we're, we're going to look at those verses. Uh, in fact, let's go right now. The, the third section, campaign to capture the distribution land. The final section is actually three little mini sections. The first one in uh, chapter 22, the debt of the tribes to God, a restating of how God gave you this. And then the return of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh to their homeland, which was on the eastern side of the Jordan. What happened is, before they even tried to cross the Jordan, uh, representatives from Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh went to Moses and said, Look, we think this is kind of cool right over here. We like this land on this eastern side of the Jordan. Can we stay here? And Moses said, Yes, you may stay here on the condition that you send your troops to cross the Jordan with everybody else and help help us in conquering the Canaanites in the Promised Land so that everybody gets a share of land. If you'll do that, then it's fine for you to claim this is your land and stay on this side. It was Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh. And so the return of those troops after mostly the Canaanite lands that the, had been conquered, um, and then finally Joshua's farewell speech at the end of his life. So let me give you a passage at the start of Joshua. This is Joshua 1, the first nine verses. So this is how it starts. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert, that's the Sinai Desert in the south, to Lebanon in the north, and from the great river, the Euphrates, which was far east, all of the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Be strong and very courageous. God says this to Joshua a number of times. In other words, this is going to be tough. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. There's a condition in there. If you obey the law, then you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. Then you will be. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is not going to be easy, but I am with you. Be strong. Take the land. And if you keep the covenant promise, if you keep your half of the deal, and remain obedient to me, follow what I have told you, then I will always make sure that I am there with you and that you will always be victorious. It is a, a covenant agreement where each side has a responsibility. Now that's not true in all covenants. Some covenants that God gave to his people were non-conditional. The covenant with Abraham, for the most part, was non-conditional. He said, Abraham, get up and go where I send you, and some people would say, well, that was a condition. Abraham had to do that. But God said, I will be your God. You will be my people. Basically, all Abraham had to do was say, okay, I agree. 
You will be our God, I will be your people. As soon as you give me people to, <laughs> to have, okay, which God did. But then there are others, the Mosaic Covenant, uh, and in this case the Palestinian Covenant, some people would call it, Pal uh, taking of Palestine. There was a very clear sense, this is what I will provide, God says, and this is what you have to do. And ultimately it just is, obey me, obey what I told you you have to obey, recognize me as God, and don't worship other gods. And they couldn't do it. Um, okay, so here's where we have the people of Israel. This, this is, uh, the, the Jordan River goes right up through here. This is the Sea of Galilee, and it comes down here to the Dead Sea. Um, there, they had come up from the south, through Moab, and they're gathered over here, all right? Moses dies, and after Moses' death, Joshua takes over, because Moses had appointed him, and God had appointed him, and then the Israelites prepare to enter the land, crossing the Jordan River over here. Now, this is about the middle of the country. This is all part of Canaan. This is all part of Canaan. So they crossed over about in the middle. And from a strategic point of view, that was the right thing to do. In fact, um, military people have said the approach that Joshua took to this was very wise. Well, that's because God was telling him what to do. Um, this is what it looked like in terms of the Canaanite peoples that existed at that time. Now, you'll notice up here, um, this little box, which you probably can't see, um, Part of these people were descendants of Ham. The Canaanites, strictly speaking, were descendants of Ham. Some of them, you know, like the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Amalekites, the Edomites, were actually Semitic peoples, descended from Noah's son Shem, just like the Jews were. So some of these people were descended from Ham, one of the sons of, of uh, Noah. Some of them were descended from Shem, and so were Semites, just like the Jews. Well, the Jews come up here, again, this is the, the Dead Sea, or Salt Sea. This is the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, as we know it, and then the Jordan River. They came up here on the east side of the Jordan River to along here. In the process, they had to go by the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Amorites, and then on the other side, they've got the Philistines, who continue to be a problem. That's who Samson was famous for fighting. Um, you have the Jebusites who controlled the city of Jerusalem and were conquered by David to take the city of Jerusalem. Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Girgasites, uh, etc. More ites than you can shake a stick at. <laughs> there were a lot of different peoples. Each of them had their own kings. Most of them really were city states. Most of them were a fortified city around which they would have some farmland and etc. But for the most part, the, the head or leader of that city would be called the king. And that's why when you read in these stories, you'll get the king of Moab and the king of the Ammonites and the king of Amalekites or sometimes the, the king of, of Jerusalem or the king of Shechem, the cities, gathered together to do battle against the Israelites. Because these were independent powers. Most of them were simply a fortified city and not much more. But there were lots of people there. Okay? That's important for us to understand. Any questions? Uh, how come they were all ites? Is there a Hebrew name that indicates that? No, I just. Uh, the, why did why did Texicans become Texans at some point? Yeah, they used to be Texicans. So they actually, the first part indicates the area. Yeah, okay, well, area. Okay, exactly. I mean, that that was their their people name, and then the ites, you know, are like Ians or whatever. Carolyn and I always joke, and she's in Wisconsin, so is she a Wisconsinite? Or a Wisconsinian? <laughs> yeah, or, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a Wisconsinite? Or a Badger? Or you know, What is she? <laughs> um, this is just the, that's, this is the traditional way in which those, those descriptors were used, and that is mostly they had ites on them. It was the Israelites. Okay? Today it's the Israelis. Yeah. The modern people are not called the Israelites. That's the name for the ancient people. Uh -huh. Now so they're, they're the Israelites. The okay? And, and that those those suffixes make a difference. I when I was teaching preaching my first uh, my third year in seminary, a uh, first year student got up and he was talking about Jesus the Nazarite. <laughs> no, he was Jesus the Nazarene. Yes, and Nazarite right. was something completely different. That was the the vow that the Old Testament vow people took. 
seeking purity. Samson was probably a Nazarite, okay? Um, that they grew their hair, you know, and various other things. So th the ending you put on those words does make a difference. Look, why aren't the Philistines the Philistines? <laughs> Philistines, I don't know. Well, and you know, the word, the name Palestine is a, is a variant on the name Philistine. Because the Philistines continue to be dominant in that area, and they actually were widely known in the eastern Mediterranean, and so that region became known as Palestine, which again is a is a, a morphing of the name Philistine. Yeah. I don't know exactly how they got from Pal from Philistine <laughs> to Palestine, but they did. How did they get from Shem to Semites? I don't know that either. I need to study that. So yes, just, Mary. Um, in this um, Benoit book, it says. It says, mentions the Palestine covenant. Now, does that mean that they, what God uh, promised to the Israelites, or is it um, some deal that they made with the Philistines? No, it is. It is the arrangement, the covenant promise to the Israelites that they would take Palestine. Okay. In fact, it's what I just read you. You know what? What the Joshua one one to nine. That if you obey me, if you follow my laws, if you don't worship other gods, then I will give you this land everywhere where you put your foot. That's the Palestinian covenant. Okay. And I will give you Palestine. Okay? Uh, and that's not usually the term for it. Okay? They, I, they don't often, other places don't often call it the Palestinian covenant. Probably because that just confuses things. People think Palestinian covenant, did that happen in 1948? Or, you know, when, when Israel became a nation? Or what's happening there? Now, so, we're, going to, we're focusing more energy, obviously, on Joshua, because uh, this, is, this is critical, the taking of the land. This gives you a sense, if you can see it from back there, and by the way, I meant to say this to beginning, at the beginning. I tried this morning to upload the files to box.com so you all could access them, and it wouldn't work. Um, it kept just grinding, and it may have been because we had trouble with our connection. Whatever, I will do it this afternoon. Obviously, the files are available, or I wouldn't have them up here. But uh, for some reason, I wasn't able to put them up. So, if you can't see that from where you are, you should be able, I'll figure out how to get them up this afternoon, you'll be able to see it. Okay. This, again, is the Salt Sea, or the Dead Sea, the Sea of Gennesaret, or the uh, Sea of Galilee as we know it, the, the River Jordan connects the two. This is the path, right here, the purple line, that the Israelites had taken, coming up past the Edomites, the Moabites and the Ammonites. This is the land of Ammon. That's where they get the Ammonites. And here is where they cross the Jordan River. They, the first place they come to is Gilgal. And that's where Joshua has them set up their sort of base of operations. It is from Gilgal that they proceed out to conquer the land. The first place they go to is Jericho, which is the first walled city that they um, approached from the time they crossed the Jordan River into the, uh, the land of Israel. By the way, the crossing of the Jordan River is in itself a, an extraordinary thing. Um, some of you have heard me preach on this. When the Israelites are on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and the Jordan's a big river at that place, it's, it's on the southern end of the river, so it's built up all of its, you know, all of its uh, power. Um, how are they going to get all these people across the river? Well, God tells Joshua, have the, the Levites, the priests, pick up, the sons of Korash, pick up the uh, Ark of the Covenant and walk into the river until their feet are wet. That's where we get the expression, getting your feet wet. <laughs> Meaning, jump into it, get started. Until their feet are wet, and then I will show you what I'm going to do. They walk into the Jordan River, the priests with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, until their feet are wet, and then God rolls back the waters of the Jordan River. And the Israelite people walk across on dry land. Okay. That does several things. One, it proves God's miraculous power and his intention to, to support them, as he had just promised, as they go into Canaan to conquer the land. The other thing it does, it's a very clear um, echoing of what God did with Moses and the Israelites at the Red Sea. The thing that absolutely anchored Moses as being the leader and the authority figure that God had anointed the Israelites as they came out of, because not everybody was in standing around in Pharaoh's palace when Moses is performing all these miracles. They didn't all see all of that. They heard about it, surely. But they were all there when Moses held out his staff and, you know, Charlton Heston said whatever, and the <laughs> waters parted and they walked across. Again, all the Israelites are here, and they experience Joshua doing, on a smaller scale somewhat, 
the same thing by the power of God. Again, anchoring him as leader, establishing his authority unquestionably as they enter the promised land. Okay? So they go across, they set up base in Gilgal. The first thing they do is they go to Jericho. When Jericho was a, a phenomenally powerful walled city by all descriptions. And God tells them, pick up the Ark of the Covenant and walk around the city once today. And then do that again tomorrow and the next day, and the next day for seven days. And on the seventh day, march around the city, and then blow all of the horns. You've got these shofars, these ram's horns that they used in, in religious service. And everybody shout. When they did, the walls of Jericho fell down. And that was the first great miraculous victory. Again, to demonstrate to the Israelites, the reason I believe God did that in that city, the first one they came to, is to say, it's not by your power this is going to happen. But they still didn't quite get it. Because the next place they come to after that is the city of Ai, Ai, and they can't conquer it. They're unsuccessful. And so Joshua goes back and says, what's going on, God? We just got beaten back. And God said, well, there's one among you who broke my rules, broke my covenant. And so they draw lots which biblically drawing the lots was a way to, to, to understand God's will. You know, it's not just luck, it's God directing this. So they drew lots and they decided which tribe it was and then which family clan it was and which family it was and which, you know, down to a person. And it turns out that that person, Achan, had stolen gold and silver and a mantle and other things that God had said, you're not to take any booty. The point being, you're not doing this to get rich. You're not doing this for the reasons that most people conquer cities and lands. You're not doing this to enrich yourself so that you can be better off, except you are taking the land for me, and I am then giving it to you as my promised gift to you. But don't take booty. You know, don't take plunder. Well, one man had done that. He's judged for it, condemned for it, executed for it. In fact, his whole family is. And then they go on from there to Gibeon and other places, and they're successful. The first thing they do from there is they do have a southern campaign where they conquer the south. That's what these red arrows and stuff are. Then they circle back around and they head north, and they conquer the people in the north. And we have archaeological evidence um, of a number of those cities from that region that were uh, destroyed. Now, the, most archaeologists say they believe the destruction was sometime in the 1200s, not in the 1300s, which is, we, we think this is the early 1300s, so not long after the, the not long after the start of the 1400s, the, the, so we're talking about the 14th century here. I don't know how that works out. There's some disagreement between archaeologists in terms of dating and what the scripture says. But it's interesting that archaeologists have determined that there were large walled cities in Canaan at that time. And that many of them were apparently destroyed right around in the, in the 13th century. Um, the cities of Hazor, which is in the north up here, which was a major city. And we have, there's a lot of archaeological stuff going on there now. Hazor, the cities in south of Lach Lachish, of Bethel, and of Debir all have archaeological evidence of having been destroyed around the same time, having been fortified walled cities that got destroyed. In that regard, even though we have some conflict between dating by about 100 or 150 years, um, there, between what the archaeologists say and what scripture seems to be saying, um, there's a lot of physical evidence that seems to bear out that stuff was going on in terms of warfare and that somebody was conquering these people about that time. Okay. And so this is going on. Uh, to give you kind of a, a visual outline of Joshua, first the initial appeal, preparation to take the land in the first five chapters. Then you get the conquest of the land from 6 to 12. This is very similar to the outline I gave you earlier, but it's a little more fun because it's visual. And then you get the act that once the land is conquered, mostly, you get the distribution of the land from chapters 13 to 21. And then you get the closing appeal of living in the land. Now the problem is, there were several places where God had told the Israelites, keep pushing forward, keep moving forward, and they didn't. They left certain cities unconquered, even though God had told them not to. Well, many, some of those cities would come back to haunt them later, in terms of those people would, be, uh, would become thorns in their sides. 
They would rise up, create constant problems. That's what the book of Judges pretty much is about. If they had done everything God had told them in the book of Joshua to conquer the land completely, they would not have had problems. But the fact they didn't, they were not fully obedient, and in fact, they actually, when they left some of these people behind, they started worshiping false gods, was the reason we continue to have conflicts in the book of, of Judges, which we'll talk about in a minute, all right? <coughs> but in the distribution of land and then the closing of people are living in the land. This is what it looked like in terms of the distribution of the land, which Joshua oversaw. Down here you have the 12 tribes, down here, over here, the 12 tribes for whom the land was divided. The tribes of Reuben, Simeon, and this is by age. All right? The oldest was Reuben. The oldest son of Jacob, or Israel, was Reuben. And so these are the people who were his descendants. Reuben's not there anymore. This, these are his descendants. Reuben, then Simeon, Zebulun, Judah, who became dominant later on, and it was from the tribe of Judah that the descent to all the way to Jesus comes. Um, David before that, and then Jesus. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, and then Manasseh and Ephraim were the two sons of Joseph, and so the, the, the split uh, of the two sons. And then Benjamin, who was the youngest child, uh, of, uh, born after Joseph, the youngest child of Jacob. The colors that you have here indicate what areas they were given and the, the amount of land they were given. It was distributed based upon how productive it was, etc., but also the amount was based upon how many people there were. Judah had become one of the largest of the tribes, and so it gets all of this area here. This little green area in the middle was Ephraim, okay, the, the, which was um, one of the sons of uh, Joseph. And then you get all of these other colors. And again, when you download this or, or go to the, when it's available this afternoon, we'll make sure it's available this afternoon, you'll be able to see that. But the land got divided up. Now you'll notice that there are people over here on this side of the Jordan. Well, that's uh, half of the tribe of Manasseh. It's the tribe of Gad, all right? Uh, and then you get the, um, uh, was it Naphtali? Who was the third one? Forget my own. But they went back. Uh, Reuben. Reuben. It's part of Reuben. That's the brown right here. Okay. Um, so they divided up the land. But they had not conquered all of it. And so we come to the book of Judges. Any questions about Joshua before we go? Levi has cities scattered throughout the whole area. Right. The Levites were cared for because they didn't get an allotment of land but there were Levitical cities, cities that were given to them, and then around the cities were enough land for them to graze, to grow crops and to graze their, um, their herds and whatnot. Then they were also to be provided for from all the other tribes by gifts, donations that were given to the temple, and then distributions for the Levites that were active in temple service were taken from that. So that's how they were cared for. But the Levites were always to be available to serve as the religious uh, people, the religious leaders, the, the priests and and servants of the temple and all of that from then on. So they, the expectation was, you don't get land because that's not going to be your focus. Your focus isn't going to be cultivating the land and taking care of it. It's going to be taking care of the religious needs of the people, and particularly the temple worship. The book of Judges follows immediately, of course, after the book of Joshua, and the time period that it's concerned with is immediately after. Uh, we don't know for certain the author of the book of Samuel, um, so we say anonymous, although it is, uh, no, it's the book of Judges, I'm sorry, I was looking at it down, we believe Samuel may have written the book of Judges, but it is the book of, book of Judges, yes. Um, the time period that it covers is 1380 BC to 1045, there's a period of about 335 years or so there that we believe it covers. Whenever you see the little C in front of a date, that means circa, which means this is best we know. This is about. Circa means about. The theme of the book of Judges is God's provision through judges. And I put quotes around that because the judges that are referred to in the book of Judges are not what you think of as judges. They weren't fat old guys in robes who decided how to interpret the law in law cases. That's not it. In fact, with the possible exception of Deborah, great woman of God, with the possible exception of Deborah, none of the judges apparently fulfilled any kind of uh, judicial role, determining law or providing that kind of leadership. Um, the, the word that we interpret judges, which is how the Septuagint originally interpreted, 
the, uh, the, the Hebrew word, in other languages, cognate languages, means regent, somebody who was responsible, you know, wasn't the king but was in charge, um, a ruler or a chief magistrate. Um, the use of the word here that we know as judge, probably deliverer or even hero, would be a better interpretation of the word that's usually translated judges in this book. Um, the purpose is to clearly demonstrate Israel's need for God and the consequences of being disobedient to Him. The outline, there's four sections in this book. The first one is the failure of Israel to complete the conquest. The first chapter talks about that. That they simply didn't follow through. They didn't finish what God had told them to do. In chapter 2 through chapter 3, the fourth verse, you get the judgment of God against them. Because not only did they not follow through in terms of finishing the job of conquering the land of Canaan, which would have been much easier if they had simply accepted that God was on their side, but they also began to worship other gods from these people. Then you get the period called uh, the deliverance of Israel. And then the depravity of Israel, when they really do begin to fall off the wagon. The whole book of Judges is a cycle, and each one of the people, we're going to look at the names, uh, well, the names are here. The, the, it's a cycle where the people are disobedient, God sends judgment in the, in the form of one of the non-Israelite uh, peoples, oppressing them. Then the people repent and pray for deliverance, and God sends deliverance in the form of one of these heroes. So it's sin, judgment, oppression, appeal for deliverance, and deliverance. And that happens with every one of the judges. Where the Israelites sin against God, he sends a power to oppress them as an act of judgment, they plead for relief, he sends them a deliverer, they are delivered, and then they do it all over again. Now it is true that it happens in different parts of the country, I'm going to show you a map in a second. But the, the judges, some of these you will have heard of, some of you won't. Some of them are only mentioned briefly. They're considered the minor judges. Some of them you will remember stories about from Sunday school. The judges in the southern part that are mentioned first are Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. In the north you get Deborah and Barak. Barak actually was the military leader because they didn't trust Deborah to be in charge of the army. So she said, fine, I'll let him be the general, but... This isn't going to be as good as you think it's going to be. And she really was the one in charge. Uh, but Barak was, was the one that the army would follow. But he was not a judge. So we put Deborah and Barak together. You then, in the central part of the country, you get Gideon, whom you've heard of. Great stories of Gideon. Uh, uh, Abimelech, who's, who's quite different. Abimelech is, is only in one town. Um, and it's, a, it's kind of a, a different little story there. Tola and Jer, and then in the eastern part you get Jephthah. Then there's another second um, series in the north, Ibzan, Elan, and Abdon, and then in the western part you get Samson. And Samson being in the west, you remember the map I just showed you? Who's in the west? The Philistines. The Philistines. That's who Samson fought against. Okay, uh, Because that's where they were. Now, if you look at this map, Oh, I'm going to give you scripture verses for you. Always scripture before the map. Right. And then, well, I should say, and then you get the deliverance of the, um, the depravity of Israel. Uh, back up. All right. In Judges, this is from the second chapter of Judges, which comes under the judgment of God part. After that, whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. So the people who had come in under... Joshua have all died now. Another generation grew up who, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals, which were the, the gods of the Canaanites. Now, I need to say something here. We are told that in addition to disobedience on the part of the Israelites, the reason God left by not conquering all of the cities, by not completely conquering the land, God let them get away with that because he says, fine, I will use these cities and these unconquered people as a test for the next generation of Israelites to see how they're going to respond. 
So disobedience on the part of the Israelites, God let them get away with it in order to use that to test the next generation. And that's what we're reading about here. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. This is the part of the, the uh, whole pantheon of Baal gods and Asherah, for whom they had the Asherah poles, were the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. When is, whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. Remember he said, as long as you're obedient to me, then you will be victorious. If not, not. They were in great distress. And continuing... Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their ancestors, they quickly turned from following the way of their ancestors, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under which... Uh, under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. There you have that little formula. Sin on the part of the people. God sends oppressors. The people cry out in distress for relief. God sends a deliverer, and they are delivered, and then they go back to their sinning again. And it starts all over. That cycle occurs with pretty much every judge that we read about here. And again, judge, not in the sense of a judicial personage, but rather a deliverer, a leader, a hero. Okay? Any questions about that? Meanwhile, what were the Levites doing? It was their job. Well, good question. What are the preachers in America doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the, the leaders of the religious order aren't always the ones that are quick to call people back to the way they should be, all right? Uh, I don't have a better answer than that. They obviously weren't being effective. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Do you have a picture of an, of, uh, an Asherah pole? An Asherah pole? Yeah. I don't. Um, well, what did he look like? Like a totem pole? Or well, uh, probably. I think that's probably a pretty good guess. I don't know. I could look into it and see if there are any estimations of what it will look like. None of them survived from antiquity. I think um, I saw one. I think I, I have studied. I, I've taken classes, and I think I saw one, a picture, because I have a, another teacher like you that has gone to many things, and I think I, she took a picture of some archaeological digs okay. and but you have to know that I get these things confused. <laughs> okay. Well and let me see if you find something, let me know and, and I'll, I'll sit, look forward if to I it. can when I go back, I'll email her and if she had that picture then I will send the Good. email. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean I, I confess I have not done a lot of research on uh and, and idols what I thought it worshipped. was was not what I thought it was. Okay. Because it talks about it a lot. Yeah, the Asherah poles. In fact, um, the uh, even some of the kings like Hezekiah and others that were good kings, when we get to the time of the kings, um, gosh, this thing keeps jumping on me. They, they would say, well, they destroyed the altars in Jerusalem, but they didn't bother to cut down the Asherah poles. Because the Asherah poles tended to be on the mountaintops. You know? But they were still gods. But they were still worshipping those gods. Josiah, one of the very best of the kings of Judah, did the most complete job. He got rid of the temple, uh, the worship areas to pagan gods that Solomon had set up, which nobody else had messed with, and he even cut down the Asherah poles and stuff. So he did the most complete job of it. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting. I'll look into that. This gives you a layout of where, approximately in this in the area, that the various kings were. You see in the far south, Othniel, Samson, here in the west, where the Philistines were, uh, Ibzan, Ehud, Abdon, um, Tola, Jephthah, Gideon, Elon, Deborah, and Shamgar in the north, uh, Jer in the north. So God 
various of these Canaanite peoples were oppressing different tribes of the Israelites in different parts of the country at different times. And God would, would raise up these heroes, these judges, in order to assist them with that. It is a, it's a time of great um, infidelity on the parts of the Israelites when they did po probably everything wrong, as you, as you just heard from the passage that I read. And all manner of different peoples uh, attacked them. Othniel, uh, the, the major judges are considered to be Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, who had Barak as the military leader, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. All of them are talked about in, in more detail. Othniel was fighting against the, the Kushan people from the Mesopotamia. Ehud was fighting against the Moabites. Uh, Deborah, the Canaanites in the north. Uh, Gideon against the Midianites and the Amalekites. Jephthah against the Ammonites. And Samson against the Philistines. So all of these people, God was using them to, express, to, to, to provide judgment because of the failings of the Israelites almost universally. But even though these guys were heroes, they weren't always real good followers. Of they all started out good. A couple of them started stumbled out. along the way, like Samson. And and you know what Samson, what did Samson in? The same thing that's done almost all the great heroes in. A woman. Sorry. Oh. Um, well, <laughs> you know, that's... that's. Uh, from what I gather, he wasn't real bright either. I mean... <laughs> Well, yeah, he, I used to have a button that said, I'm not real bright, but I can lift heavy things. Samson could have worn that button. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yet God gave him miraculous power. And those of you who have been in, in the class, was it this class or the other class that I talked about the different gods and I told you about Dagon, was the god of the Philistines? Yes. The other class, okay. Well, Dagon was the god of the Philistines, and at one point the, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant in battles against the Israelites, and they took the Ark of the Covenant to the temple of Dagon, and then twice, two mornings in a row, they found that the, the idol image of Dagon fallen over on its face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And then the second time it was broken up, actually. Uh, but then the, the Temple of Dagon was where they took Samson after they cut his hair and captured him. When Delilah tricked him into this. And he had been weakened, but he asked for God for one more display of strength. They chained him between two column pillars that in the Temple of Dagon so that he, he said he was blind. They, took, they put his eyes out. And he said, let me feel these. And in one burst of strength at the end, he pushed apart these pillars. And the whole temple fell in. And all these people that had gathered around to celebrate the, you know, the capture and blinding of their great enemy, Samson, they were all killed. Well, interestingly enough, they have found Canaanite temples in which on one end, sort of the axe end, or the, you know, the kind of uh, focal end, there are two pillars that sit like six or seven feet apart that are central to the main support for the roof. The description that we have in Judges of what Samson did seems to be completely borne out in terms of the way the temples in, in that part of Canaan were designed. Um, so, which is pretty cool. Okay, uh, any other questions about the Judges? We're going to move on. Um, I, I did mention Abimelech. Abimelech is a little bit different in terms of he was the son of Gideon, so his father had been one of the judges. He was the son of Gideon by a concubine. Uh, he was only involved in one city, the city of Shechem, and so there are, there are other ways in which he was, he was quite different. But still he was acknowledged as being anointed by God to provide relief to the Israelites in the city of Shechem. Okay? Um, let's move on now to the next book. You will notice we are skipping Ruth. Ruth comes under the writings part. We'll talk about that in the, uh, the section when we get to the writings. We are using the Jewish order, not the, the typical Western or Christian order. I like the Ruth. It was kind of in between all this war and stuff, the thing. It was yeah. kind of nice and comforting. Yeah, I like Ruth, too. It's a great story. One yeah, of them, it Ruth is. and Esther are two of the most heartwarming stories. And, you know, Ruth is a good romance uh -huh. um, kind of thing. So, okay. The book of Samuel, again traditionally written by Samuel, um, probably written about 930 BC, but the time period that it covers is about 11, about 1100 BC to 1013. Um, the theme here is transition from theocracy under the judges. Theocracy means rule by God. God was directly involved in the people, uh, what happened to the people, their political control, and everything else, if they'd been listening to him. Um, and then he acted through the judges. But then to monarchy under kings. In fact, the end of the book of Judges says, 
And there was no king in the land, and every man did what was good in his own eyes. Which is the definition of anarchy. Okay. There was no uh, political centrality, there was no law, uh, rule of law, there was no order, it was a mess. So we get into the book of Samuel, and God uh, raises up, the first part of Samuel, the first eight chapters, is the raising up of the last of the judges, who is Samuel. And I see Samuel sitting around the corner there. You're named after a really good guy, Samuel. Um, Samuel was both a judge, the last of the line of judges, meaning he was a hero, a deliverer that God raised up. He was also a prophet of God. He spoke the word of the Lord. Um, and, and in his case, he, some of what he spoke was actually prophetic in terms of seeing into the future. And he was a priest of God. You know, the guy was a triple threat. He was judge, prophet, and priest. A great man of God who from his very earliest days, God had, had had his mother bring him to the temple. He was raised in the temple as obedient to, to God. Um, and so the purpose of this book is to see how God first uses his prophet Samuel to give the people what they want, not what they need, but what they want, and that is a king to rule over them, the first king being Saul, and then it has to do with the failure of Saul, which leads to David becoming king. Yes, Michael? Does that mean he came from the tribe of Levi? Um, it would have been, yes, because he was taken as a child. I have to confirm that. Uh, I was, uh, because he was taken as a child, and then that's kind of the Levi. Um, right, but his, his, his mother, what happened was his mother was... She was, was, him. Uh, she was, uh, was unable to bear children. She prayed. She was given a child. She promised to give the child back to God. And then when he was still very young, she took him and presented him to the temple to be raised there. It's likely that he had to be from the tribe of Levi to be accepted for that, but I have to check on that. I don't know for a fact. It's likely, but, but I'll look at it. It was an unusual circumstance. It wasn't the way it was usually done. Ordinarily, somebody who served in the temple would be, their father had been a priest. you know, And so it, there was a, a passing down from, one, from father to son in terms of that. He was different, and a, an exception was made. Because, you know, the priest in charge of the temple had been there when his mother had asked for a blessing, and she was older, and when she did have a child, and she explained it, they said, well, okay, that's, that's fine. Um, so, we get, in terms of an outline, the first eight chapters are about, about Samuel, the first judge. Yes, Jeanette. Um, isn't Saul a son of David? Uh, no. Saul is the, um, came before David. There's two Sauls, two prominent Sauls in the Bible. One is the first king of Israel. David is the second king of Israel. And then um, later on, there's Saul in the New Testament who became Paul, the apostle. All right? But those are two different names. Um, so Samuel, first eight chapters. Then Saul is the first king from chapter 9 to chapter 15. And then David, the second king, from chapter 16 to 31. Give you a little bit of a timeline. Saul was... Um, the king from about 1050 to 1010, about 40 years. David comes in and is king from 1010 to about 970, about 40 years. These are all circa. And then Solomon from 970 to 930, about 40 years. Okay, Those, that's the best dating we have on that. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. First, from 1 Samuel 8. But when they said, now Samuel, this is, this is the 8th chapter where Samuel has you know, been a judge and a prophet. He is speaking for God, and the people are, have recognized him as a leader, as, as a judge. And they speak to Samuel. And when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. I told you he was a good guy. And his frustration and, and whatnot, his first thing is to turn to God with it. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you, Samuel, they are re have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Samuel was taking it personally. He was the judge and prophet, and they said, we want a king. You're not good enough. God says, don't worry about it, Samuel. It's not you they have a problem with. It's me. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them. But warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Right after this, right after verse 9, 
Samuel goes back to the Israelites and he gives them this long litany. Let me tell you what a king will do. Take your sons to be his soldiers. Take your daughters to be his maidservants. Take your crops to feed his noblemen. Take your animals to be part of his herds and flocks. Take your gold to make you know his stuff, his played out of. And he goes in this long litany. This is what you get when you get a king. And they go, we don't care, we want a king. Like all the other people have kings, they say. Remember, most of those kings were kings over city states. You know, there was the king of Bethel and the king of uh, Shechem and the king of this and that. But they wanted a king. There also was a king over Egypt called the Pharaoh. There was a king over the, uh, the Hittites. And it, one of the things that's happening in this time, by the way, I should have said this earlier, the major powers that existed in the world at this time would have been during the, the taking of the land and into the time of the judges would have been Egypt, in the south, that's where the Israelites came from. But we also had the power had grown by this time in what we know of as Turkey, which was Asia Minor, which was the Hittite Empire. Right? Then you also had the growth of Mesopotamian power. You remember I mentioned to you that Mesopotamia, the peoples of Mesopotamia, were one of the one of the uh, some of the raiders had come out of Mesopotamia that the judges had to help deal with. So those three, and when we say the growth of Mesopotamia, that would be Assyria and Babylon eventually came out of those areas. So Assyria is beginning to grow. The Hittite Empire exists in the north of what we know as Turkey or Asia Minor uh, and Egypt. But during this particular time, the Exodus, Egypt was still in power, but they were waning. And then during the time of the taking of the land and of the judges, not, there were no major world powers who really were in a position to do much about what was happening in Canaan in Palestine. Okay. All of them were pretty much occupied with their own stuff right then. None of them were in conquering mode like they usually were. And so that's how the Israelites, this little, you know, this nomadic tribal people who had, who had fled slavery in Egypt, how they were able to fight just city states instead of trying to fight Assyria or the Hittite Empire or Egypt. Right? So all that's going on right now. Um, let me give you another passage here. This one is from 1 Samuel 15. <coughs> this is when Saul, well, let me back up here before you go. Saul is anointed king, and Saul is quite the character. He's tall and powerful and strong and handsome and well-spoken, and everything about him is what they thought they wanted as a king. He's the first king, and God uh, sends Samuel to anoint him. He is anointed king. But, while Saul has success in military campaigns and things, Saul also gets full of himself. And he starts thinking that this is all because he is so great, and not because God is so great. And so Saul does several things where he starts to presume that he has the right to do pretty much whatever he wants. Kind of the last straw is, again, remember, Samuel is the priest and prophet of God. The religious stuff, like offering sacrifices, is to be done by Samuel, not by the king. This is the first instance that we're, we're aware of, you know, in our, our history, so to speak, where we have a conflict between church and state. Because there's a point at which, as they're getting ready to go to battle, in this big battle, they're waiting to make sacrifice to God, Yahweh God before they go to battle. Well, Samuel's late. He's not, he hasn't arrived when he said he was going to. He wait, they're waiting for him and waiting for him. And the people start getting antsy. The soldiers start getting antsy. And it says some of them decide they want to go home. All right? If we're not going to fight, let's go home. And so Saul takes it upon himself to go ahead and offer the sacrifices to God in preparation for the battle. Well, as soon as he does that, Samuel arrives and says, what have you done? This is not your place. You have assumed that you are the priest of God, and that's not your right. And this was kind of the last straw. And then we have this passage in 1 Samuel 15. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the Lord? In other words, you think the sacrifice was okay when you know you did what God told you not to do? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion, rebellion against God, is like the sin of divination, magic, 
and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Blame somebody else, why don't you? Okay. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. We have lots of examples. And, and this is a great life truth I'm about to give you here. Um, the examples where God does not accept somebody's apology or request for forgiveness is almost always immediately after they've tried to blame somebody else and it didn't work. Okay? The people who have committed sins against God or major crimes, and this is true in human society as well, and then immediately admitted that they were at fault, like David, who committed adultery with Bathsheba and then committed murder by having her husband killed. When Nathan confronted him, David did not make any excuses. He said, I have sinned against God. It's my fault. And he repented in very practical ways. And he accepted the fact that there were going to be um, problems. He was going to have to pay for having committed that sin. Even though God still loved him, he was going to have to, so to speak, sleep in the bed that he had made by his own sin. But God did not reject him as king because he didn't try to blame somebody else. First thing Saul tried to do in every instance is find somebody else to blame for it, including here. Well, the men made me do this. Okay. Adam, when God said to Adam, well, why did you do this? Well, the woman that you gave me, ultimately it's your fault, the woman you gave me made me do this. All right? God does not accept us trying to shuffle the blame for something we've done off on somebody else. And the difference between how God responds to people who have sinned and are caught in their sin is the difference between how they reacted immediately upon being apprehended, so to speak. Saul tried to blame somebody else. David did not. And that's why Saul was replaced and David was not. Even though David had consequences that had to be paid. Okay? And that's a life truth. You can see that in politics as well. Um, yes, Ron. Can we not take from the reading of these scriptures and really see the essence of that in our world today? Oh, well, I think absolutely. Tell me what you're thinking. Oh, too much. <laughs> okay, too much. Well, that's, that's an example. And, and I'm going to give you an example which, um, well, which it, it, and this, it's going to sound like I'm making a political statement. I am not. I'm making a historical statement. I'm going to give you two characters in recent history. Richard Nixon got caught, said he wasn't guilty, tried to blame everybody else, including his own senior guys going to jail, and he was completely rejected, left office. Nobody trusted him anymore after that. And again, this is not a positive statement, but Oliver North, when he was, you know, before the Senate, and thinking they were going to get him, they said, <clears throat> Is it true that when the investigators were in your outer office, you were in the inner office destroying documents? And Ollie North looked up and said, yeah, did I get them all? <laughs> <laughs> I am not defending Oliver North. He's not the role model I would want us to maintain, okay? But he was accepted back into the good graces of the public because he said, yeah, I did that. There are reasons why I thought I should do that, and I did it. I'm not going to blame somebody else. Now... I only give you that example not to try to make some political statement one way or the other. But even today, people who will own up immediately to what they've done, there is a natural tendency to find them more acceptable, even if they have to make consequences for it, jail time or whatever, rather than people who make excuses or try to, you know, try to, you know, try to blame somebody else or try to, you know, get out from under it by some sleazy circumstance or sleazy excuse, all right? That's a human truth that I think we see even in modern politics. Okay. All right. Uh, so, first book of Samuel, we have Solomon. We have Saul, the first king who is rejected. And then we end up with the second king, King David. King David is one of the three greatest figures of the Old Testament. The three truly great figures of the Old Testament. 
our father Abraham, the figure who was the father to the Hebrew people, Moses, who was more than just the lawgiver, he was the redeemer, the one who brought them up as God's, hand, God's leader, brought them up out of slavery in Egypt. And then you have King David, the king. So father, Abraham, redeemer, Moses, king, David. The family figure, the redeemer figure, and the political leader. Those are the three great, great images, archetypes of the Old Testament, David being the third. And in fact, after David, from then on until the time of Jesus, the Israelites were always saying, we're waiting for the heir of David. We're waiting for a new King David. One of the reasons they couldn't accept Jesus when he came was because they thought he was going to be a great political leader to make them great as a nation again, like David had done. Well, that wasn't why Jesus came, and they couldn't accept that, even though Jesus was perfectly the fulfillment of being Father, Redeemer, and King. The only person who came that fulfilled all three of those things. Right? But that's why he could not be accepted. Ross? Yes? Why... Why was uh, why did David not take power as soon as he was anointed? Why did they have? Because he was a child. When David was anointed, he was he was a teenager. And what they did was, uh, you know, Saul was rejected. Saul sent Solomon to the house of Jesse, and Jesse had a whole bunch of sons, and they were apparently quite quite magnificent specimens. These young men. And so Saul, uh, Saul, sorry, Samuel goes in, and the oldest one comes in, and this God, the Spirit, speaking and you know, whispering in, in Saul, um, Samuel's ear, and he says, "Not this one." Second one, not this one, not this one. And they all come in, and none of them are acceptable according to what God is saying to Samuel. And Samuel says, "Are these all of your sons?" And they go, "Well, we've got the young one, the little one, who's out in the fields taking care of the sheep. He's a shepherd, but you don't want him." And Samuel says, bring him in. They bring David in. He's a young boy. He's a teenager. And God says, this is the one. And Samuel anoints him, but he's not in a position to take over him. And so David is... Um, Saul starts having all kinds of problems, including mental problems. That's why I thought David ought to... Yeah. Well, you thought so. Well, he was too young. <laughs> Saul starts having mental problems, and so one of his one of the people in Saul's uh, palace say, you know, maybe what we need is somebody who plays really not sweetly on the harp, because that's very calming, and maybe that will help call, calm Saul when he's having these fits of either depression or anger or whatever they were. And they go, well, you know, I think the youngest son of Jesse plays the harp really beautifully. Let's bring him in and see what Saul thinks. That's David. So they bring David in. He plays. It seems to soothe Saul. David becomes a you know a young sort of courtier servant to uh, Saul, and then over a period of time, eventually you know there's the, the scene with uh, later when when the armies of Israel under Saul are fighting against the Philistines, and the Philistines send out this giant Goliath who's huge, and David happens because David's older brothers are in the army. David goes to where the battle is, they're waiting, to, you know, they, they, they would do a whole lot of sitting on opposite hillsides and yelling at each other before they actually had fights back then. And so that's what's going on. In several days, Goliath had been coming out saying, I will do hand-to-hand -hand combat with anybody you send. Because that's another thing, a battle, a battle between champions. You know, sometimes instead of whole armies fighting, they would each pick their best guy, they would fight. And whoever won, they, that side would claim the battle. Okay. Well, Goliath was trying to get somebody to fight him, but nobody was willing to do it. David goes to the army to take supplies to his brothers. When he's there, he hears this guy, Goliath, screaming obscenities at the Israelite army, and Saul, and everybody else, and, and David says, Who is this pagan to be shouting against God's own chosen? And they go, ooh, you might want to hold it down, David. <laughs> Don't make him mad. Did you notice him? You know? And David says, I'll fight him. And they're going, you'll what? Well, Saul says, well, okay, if you want to. And they try to dress him in armor. The armor doesn't fit. David said, I can't wear this stuff. And David says, I have killed lions and other wild beasts in order to protect the flock. I will kill him just like I've killed wild beasts in protecting the flock. 
He picks up a stone from the river or the, the stream. He goes out. Goliath is screaming. He says, come over here and I'll leave your flesh for the birds, little Israelite. Kind of thing. You know. And that's the story of the Goliath. Now, he is still just a boy. Now, from that point, he starts to get involved in military campaigns. And in fact, sort of the thing that really puts Saul over the edge is after a great victory against the Philistines, and David had led, you know, had led them in, in the best part of that. They come back into Jerusalem, and people are screaming, you know, praise Saul who's killed his thousands, and David who has killed his tens of thousands. And Saul's furious that David's getting more credit than he is, even though David's still a young man. And that starts the conflict where Saul tries to kill David, and then he's te he sees Saul's back and forth. He wants to kill him, then he repents from that. Then he wants to kill him, then he repents from that. Saul's son, Jonathan, becomes very close to David. Um, they're like brothers. And ends up trying to, one, trying to get his father Saul to lead to not want to kill David. And then to help support David when he's running for it. Twice, David has the opportunity to kill Saul. While Saul is asleep, once while he's asleep. And once while he, he went into a cave to use the bathroom. Okay. And David was in the cave behind him. And he could have killed him, and he didn't. Because he said, this is God's anointing. Later on, when Saul dies by his own hand, he is defeated in battle, his sons are killed, he, he's wounded, he falls on his own sword, rather than be taken alive. And things are not going so well, because David's not helping him at that point. He's on the run, he's out in the wilderness. And Saul falls on his own sword, when somebody comes back, and David steps in and is anointed king. Well, somebody shows up boasting to David about how, boy, it's really good that they got rid of that Saul, you know, and I, I was there, and I was great. Well, David has this guy killed for boasting about this, and mm -hmm. says, you don't speak about, the, about God's anointed like that. For all of Saul's problems, David was a man of honor who said he was anointed by God, whatever wrong he did later, and whatever judgment he received for it, he was God's anointed. And David becomes the great king. Okay? Yes? Concerning the age of David, why was Josiah an exception later then? Because he was so young. Well, um, remember, David was only the second king that Israel had. Later on, by, the, by Josiah's time, it became a regular thing. In fact, we didn't have in, uh, rule by inheritance at this point. Okay? There wasn't the sense of that. It was by God's anointing. Samuel was God's priest and prophet who did the anointing. God spoke through him to select the king. By the time of Josiah, it was the children of the previous king, the son of the previous king, the oldest son. And it had become a matter of inheritance then. And so that's why, not only in Israel, but everywhere else, you have cases where a father dies and he leaves a six-month-old six son, or whatever, you know, some young son. And so frequently somebody would be named regent or the person in charge to look after things until the kid grew up. And that's what happened in the cases of the Israelite kings too. Okay? All right. I'm going to have to move a little The Bible here. didn't say anything about how many years from that time that he killed Goliath till he was anointed at 30, wasn't he? We could probably figure it out. But um, there were a number of years in there because he, he, after that he was involved in military campaigns for a while and then was on the run for quite a while. Um, I don't know the answer to it, but we can probably figure it out. Okay. All right. The book of 2 Samuel, and I mentioned this to you all before, I think, but the reason why we have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, and 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, and even Ezra and Nehemiah, is because these books originally were written on either papyrus or later parchment, and then attached together and put on scrolls. <clears throat> well, 1 and 2 Samuel together, or 1 and 2 Kings together, whatever, those are one, 1st and 2nd Samuel is one book in the Hebrew Bible. But when they used to make scrolls, and they would, they would write on a piece, and then they would glue it to the next piece, and write on that, and glue it to the next piece, and write on that, when you roll all those up, they got to be too fat a scroll to deal with. So they broke them in half. But kings, actually if I were really staying true to the, to the Hebrew uh, outline of the Bible, I would have given you Samuel, one and two, kings, one and two, and then Ezra and Nehemiah is one book, but we're used to seeing them this way. They have the same author, they cover the basic same time period, um, so there's certain similarities. The, the book of 2 Samuel picks up after David has become king, 
And it has to do with the reign of King David and the growth of Israel under his kingship. The rule under King David and then Solomon, who really, who really inherited all that David had done and added a little more by political, being politically astute, really was the high point in Israel's history in terms of them being a geopolitical uh, factor. Geopolitical means they were a political entity, but more than that, they controlled an area of land. So the purpose is to tell the story of David, the most popular king, one of the most important figures in Jewish history, but to tell it with complete honesty, including his successes, his failures, his faithfulness, and his sin, and his eventual repentance for that sin. So the outline is very simple. There are the triumphs of David in terms of his further taking of the land. He's, he starts finishing what was not completed under Joshua in the taking of the land. Then the transgressions of David in chapter 11, and his, he had two primary transgressions that I mentioned. He committed adultery with Bathsheba because went up on his roof one night and looked over and she, her mirror door was apparently lower than his. And he saw her taking a bath and she was a beautiful woman. Being king of, of everything and could do pretty much whatever kings in those days could do whatever they wanted. He asks somebody, who is that? And they say, that's Bathsheba, the wife, of Uriah, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He goes, I'd like to meet her. Whatever you say, king. They end up having an affair. She gets pregnant. Uriah the Hittite was a soldier in his army, and so he calls his general. He First he tries to get Uriah the Hittite right away to come home in order for everybody to think that he was the father of this child. Okay. Uriah is such a man of honor, he refuses to go home and sleep in his bed and sleep with his wife while all the rest of the soldiers have to still be out in, in, in tents on the battlefield. And so he refuses. After he won't do it the first night, David tries to get him drunk. And the next morning finds him sleeping on the steps outside because he refuses to go home. I will not accept the comfort of my home and my bed and my wife when all of my brothers in arms are out fighting this war in tents on hard ground. So, since he couldn't trick him into it, David gives instructions to the head of his army to put Uriah in the front of the battle with it, fighting his fiercest, and then withdraw from him so he'll be killed. And that's what they do. So now David's guilty of not only adultery and, and, foster, and bearing an illegitimate child by somebody else's wife, but of murder. And there's this extraordinary story that is told when Nathan, who was then, by this time, the prophet, goes to David and says, David, I want to tell you a story. You guys know the story? He says, there was a man who was wealthy. He had fields and crops and animals galore. There was another man who was poor, and this man had one little lamb. And this lamb, he loved it like a child. He fed it by hand and nurtured it and held it and it slept with it. Well, the rich man had a guest come, and he didn't want to kill any of his own animals, so he took the lamb from the poor man and had it slaughtered to feed his guests. What do you think about that, David? And David, in anger, said, that man should be killed. And Nathan says, you are the man. You are the king of all Israel. You have wives and concubines. Nothing is outside your control. And yet you take the wife of a man who had nothing else, and then you kill him. And David says, I have sinned before God. And he, he acts in repentance. And then later on, as we learn in 2 Samuel, this is the troubles of David. The result, the consequences of David's sins are God does not reject him because he confessed his sin. And he didn't blame anybody else. He, he acknowledged the fact that it was completely wrong, and he, he, he violated God's trust in him. But his own son, Absalom, rebels against him. All right? uh, he's forced to flee the palace. And it looks like he's going to completely lose everything. Absalom takes over. He ends up being able to come back. There's a civil war that occurs. His, two of his sons are killed in the process, Amnon and, and Absalom. And David, his heart is broken by all of this. And yet he's still the great king. All right? give you a scripture verse here. This is from 2 Samuel 7, verse 8, and then verse 11 to 16. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
I will be his father. And he's talking about Solomon here, who was not the oldest son. The oldest sons were killed. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by human, be by human beings, with floggings afflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. I should say that the first thing in terms of grief or, that, uh, or trouble that David had to experience is the child that was born to Bathsheba, because after Uriah, uh, Uriah the Hittite was killed, um, David marries Bathsheba. She has the son that they had born um, before they were married, and that child dies, and David is heartbroken about it. Um, then two of his other sons are killed in the Civil War, and he almost loses the kingship through the Civil War. And then the second son that Bathsheba bears to him is named Solomon. And Solomon is the one being talked about here. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. The promise is, David, I will continue your line as long as, you know, he says, you and your son will maintain the kingdom. See, even later when Solomon marries foreign wives and sets up places of worship for foreign gods, horrible foreign gods, Canaanite gods, God has promised he will not remove Solomon. He said, I will afflict him with floggings inflicted by human hands. In other words, he'll pay some consequences, but I will not take the kingdom from him. But what he does is, because of Solomon's sin, when Solomon does die, then the kingdom is split. Okay, let's talk about that. This is, to give you some idea, if you can tell here, um, this big, well, this green area right here, is the area that Saul had controlled when he was king. The purple area, the dark purple area, is how much more David conquered and made part of the kingdom of Israel when he was king. And then when Solomon came in, he added this area up here to the north, not by conquest, because Solomon didn't have to fight, but he did it by political, uh, being politically astute. Now, let's look at the book of 1 Kings. I've only got about five more minutes, so we're going to rip through the Kings. <laughs> we do not know who the, who the writer of 1 Kings was. Traditionally, it was Jeremiah, which means it would have been written about 550 B.C., but it has to do with the time immediately after Solomon, and Solomon reign uh, ended about 930. Um, well, actually, this includes Solomon, so it would be from about 970. It's An easy way to remember this is King David was about 1,000. Okay, that's easy to remember. David was about 1,000 B.C. So, uh, the, it's the theme of 1 Kings is the reign of David's son, King Solomon, which brings them to the peak of Israel's power and influence. It involves the building of the temple and of the palace, the two great monuments to God's glory and to the power of the Israelite kingdom. Um, David had wanted to build a palace. David had said to God, why should I live in a palace made of cedar when you have to live in a tent? Because the tabernacle was still in existence then, which was the dwelling that had been first designed and created, God had given to the Israelites in the desert when they were wandering around. That was still the official place of meeting. It was called the tent of meeting, where God was supposed to live. And so David wanted to build a, a proper temple. God said, no, you have been a man of war, and your hands are covered in blood. Not, not necessarily your fault. God, God sent David on those um, campaigns of war. But your son will build my temple. So David gathered all the gold and the, and the jewels and the silver and everything and the wood and everything was needed. So that as soon as he died and Solomon took over, Solomon built the temple. In fact, this temple was inaugurated four years after Solomon took over as king. So um, the building of the temple and then of the palace of Solomon. And then eventually Solomon's decline, which led to the divided kingdom. Solomon, as I say, married foreign wives. God told him two things you can't do. Now, Solomon started out great. The wisdom of Solomon. Um, when God asked Solomon, right after he became king, what do you desire of me? And Solomon said, give me wisdom sufficient to rule this people, this great people that you made the king over. And God said, wow, most guys in your position would have asked me for wealth, or victory over my enemies, or lots of pretty girls, or something else. 
but the fact that you have asked me for wisdom to rule over my people, the Israelites, I will give you what you ask, plus I will make you great. I will not only give you wisdom, I will make you a great power, I will give you victory and lands, you will have no enemies that can, you know, that can compare to you in power, etc., etc. So that was the blessing of God. And then Solomon married all these women he wasn't supposed to marry, and he gathered a lot of horses he wasn't supposed to get. That was one of the other things God told him, is do not collect a bunch of horses. As I've told you before, I think horses were the sign of warfare. Horses were only used in war, and yet, because even though God, and what God was saying is, I don't want you to be a man of war. You aren't going to have any serious enemies. You don't have to prepare for war. And yet, Solomon did. Anyway, because it was a sign of power and pride. And so he did that, um, and that was another thing that he, he defied God in. But God had promised David, I will, your son will continue. If he does bad things, he'll get punished corporally for it, but he will not be taken from the kingship. Becky? Um, why do you think Solomon was chosen over the other sons? Because of the circumstances he came out of and all that, why do you think he was still chosen? I can't really presume to know God's mind in that. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was, for a long time, he was a great king. It was fairly late that he ended up really messing stuff up. But he started out exactly on the right track, seeking God, worshiping God, asking not for wealth or power, but for wisdom to rule the people, and he was ruling them wisely. He really did. I mean, David established them, but Solomon reached even a higher level in terms of recognition. Um, you know, you, you've got the, the Queen of Sheba from Africa, who was that, that's when Northern Africa, there was a land of great wealth and everything else. She comes up to see this Solomon, who's become so famous, and she said, even the stuff I heard, which was unbelievable, doesn't match how glorious your court is and how wonderful, how wise you are and all of that. So he was a pretty spectacular guy. Michael? I was wondering the same thing. I think I'm going back further than that, wondering why from Bathsheba, such sinful circumstances. Maybe there's an illustration there. Yeah, well, Solomon was not illegitimate. He was, he was conceived and born after they were married. It may have been... Again, I can't presume to know, but I could maybe surmise that David had been punished for his sin of transgression with Bathsheba, and maybe this was God's way of saying, but, you know, I have forgiven you for that. You paid consequences for it. I've forgiven you, and out of that same relationship, I am going to bring the next king. I don't know. Okay. Let's get married. Let's get married. Yeah, well, they did get married. <laughs> All right, uh, so the purpose is to show obedience to God, how it led to greatness for Israel, while disobedience led to, disrupt, uh, to destruction. We're going to be five minutes late. Let me finish this. 1 Kings 9, the Lord said to him, Solomon, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple, after Solomon built the temple, which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, Solomon, if you walk before me faithfully, with integrity of heart and uprightness, as, your, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. And I, as I promised David your father when I said, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. Well, the throne of Israel didn't last after Solomon, so God didn't break his promise. But if you, but if you or your descendants turn away from me, do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land I've given them, and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Okay. Then we have Second Kings. Again, unknown, but traditionally Jeremiah, since it's the other half of uh, the, the book of Kings. It is the story of two divided kingdoms. Because after Solomon's death, because Solomon had worshipped other gods, he did cut Israel off from the land, first by dividing it in half, so that the southern kingdom ended up being just, uh, here we go. Um, this ends up being the two kingdoms. You'll notice I lost a lot. This whole area here was the total part under David Solomon. Afterwards, there were rebellions. The white part here was the kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah, which was the tribe of Judah um, and part of the tribe of, of um, Ephraim. I forget stuff too. Um, and then this pink part was the northern kingdom of Israel, which was the other ten tribes. That division in the south, um, 
Solomon's son maintained authority as the king. In the north, a usurper, Rehoboam, took over, and he became king of the northern kingdom. And the two, for the next several hundred years, would fight sometimes, they would ally sometimes, they were back and forth. And so the book of 2 Kings is the story of how the unfaithfulness that Solomon had to God ended up leading to discipline. The first 16 chapters tell the story of the divided kingdom. In the 17th chapter, we hear about the fall of Israel in the north in 722 BC. In 722, the kingdom of the north, the, the, immediately when the northern kingdom is established, they're cut off from the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's in the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel doesn't have Jerusalem or the temple anymore, so they start creating their own ways of worshiping. In fact, that area, which was the capital of the northern kingdom, was called Samaria. That's where we get the Samaritans, the good Samaritan in the New Testament. Later on, they were considered half-breeds. I'll talk about that a little bit next week. But Samaria, we have what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, which I told you about. The Samaritan Pentateuch is the first five books of the law, but they're different some, in some ways. One way they're different is they have 11 commandments. The 11th commandment being that God told them to build a place of worship on Mount Gezerim, which is right outside the city of Samaria, and worship God there since you no longer can get to the temple in Jerusalem. So they added a commandment. Well, part of their worship is they started worshiping foreign gods. They got worse and worse and worse. The kings of the north, none of them are considered to have been good kings. It included people like Ahab and his, his horrible wife Jezebel, who persecuted uh, Elijah. You do have the story here of the great stories of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. And then you have the fall of the northern kingdom to Assyria. God uses the kingdom of Assyria, which is in modern day Iraq, so it's, it's northeast of here. They come in, conquer the northern kingdom. Assyria was ruthless. When they conquered a people, they forced all of those people to be spread out through the rest of their empire as slaves. And they brought other slaves in and forced them to intermarry. So that's where we get the lost tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of the north that were destroyed by the conquest of Assyria were lost to history. The Samaritans, who, who were half Jewish, you know, they were intermarried with other peoples, they didn't follow the law, according to the Jewish tradition really, that's why they didn't get along with the Jews. That's why the story of the Good Samaritan is about somebody who should have been completely a reject from the Jewish point of view, and yet... Jesus uses him as a story of somebody who's compassionate and good. The Samaritans were thought of as being half-breeds and low-lives and don't ever even have anything to do with them. The woman at the well of Samaria that Jesus talks to, she goes, excuse me, he asks her for a drink of water. She goes, excuse me, why are you talking to me? One, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. And then secondly, you're a man and I'm a woman. You don't do that. But Jesus did it. And he broke down those barriers. So, 2 Kings is about that... Um, divided kingdom, kingdom of Judah in the south, the white, the pink, which was the, later the kingdom of Israel. And then, this is another map that shows the same thing. Again, the kingdom of Judah here, the kingdom of Israel is this dotted line here. And this shows, with the colors, it shows which peoples were in uh, which place. The south was Judah and uh, Ephraim, and the north was all the other ten tribes. Okay. Now, two quick verses, and then I'll let you go. One of them is from 2 Kings 17. This is the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel, which was in 722 B.C. Again, they had had no good kings. The south had a few good kings, like Hezekiah, who actually held out against Assyria for a while, etc. So, 2 Kings 17, 5. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria. Samaria was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. And laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured, uh, Hosea was the king of the north, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Halah, in Gozan, on the Harbor River, and in the town of the Medes. He spread them out. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God. They had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had, had introduced. The, the kings were partly responsible for this false worship. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places, that's a place of worshiping pagan gods, on, um, 
In all their towns they set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree, at every high place they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that provoked the Lord to anger. They worshipped idols, though the Lord had said, you shall not worship idols. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. The southern kingdom was better. They had the, the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. They had some good kings. Hezekiah was there when Assyria tried to invade uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, and Hezekiah held out and said, no, the Lord has told me that he's going to protect us. And one night, the Assyrians go to sleep. The next morning, they wake up, and thousands and thousands of them are dead. Um, the traditional idea is that God sent a plague in their midst, and Hezekiah, or the, I'm sorry, the Assyrian uh, king turned around, I think it was Ashurbanipal, turned around and headed back to, uh, to Assyria, because much of his army was dead. Now, the Assyrians have record of this, we have the documents, and they say, well, there were some problems at home that he needed to go back and take care of. Um, by the way, the Assyrian kings had great names. Ashurbanipal, Tiglath-Pileser III, you know, <laughs> Sennacherib, anyway. Um, then, the southern kingdom of Judah, while they, had, they were better, they still got pretty bad. And in 586, they get destroyed uh, by, this time, Babylon. Assyria has gone in decline. Babylon, or Babylonian Empire, has grown up. One more verse, and you can go for the day. 2 Kings 25. This is the, the destruction of the southern kingdom in 586. So this is about 140 years later. On the seventh day of the fifth month, in the 19th year, of Nebuchadnezzar, recognize that, the king of Babylon, Nebuch uh, Nebuzaradan, Nebuzaradan, sorry, commander of the imperial guard, an official in the, uh, of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile the people who remained in the city, along with the rest of the populace, and those who had gone over to the king of Babylon. But the commander left behind some of the poorest people of the land to work the vineyards and fields. So Judah went into captivity away from her land. The difference was Babylon, or the Babylonian Empire, they didn't spread the people out. They didn't force them to intermarry. They didn't bring other slaves in. They left some of the folks there. And they took some of the youngest and brightest to actually work in the capital city of Babylon. That's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's part of the Babylonian captivity. And not too long after this, Babylon, or the Babylonian Empire, is then conquered by Persia. And the, one of the very first things we have on record that the King Cyrus of Persia did was he let the Jews who had been in captivity in Babylon, who had not intermarried, they were still distinct as a people, go back to Israel and rebuild under Ezra and Nehemiah the temple in the city. And therein finishes the reading of the second kings. Any questions about that? I'm sorry I've gone over 10 minutes. Yes, Mary. Is, uh, is that when the temple was totally destroyed? Because I thought that was later when the battle was There are two temples. There is a first temple period, which ends in 586, when the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians destroy the original temple of Solomon. And then when the Persians let them go back, they rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel, Okay, Zerubbabel is the one who rebuilds it. It's the Ezra Nehemiah story. That's the second temple, which has continued to exist until the time of Jesus. And in AD 70, the Romans destroyed the second temple. In fact, if you get into the history, they talk about the first temple period and the second temple period. Anything else? Homework. Assignment. Homework. Assignment. Um, I didn't have it up here, and I don't remember off the top of my head. I looked it up. Read in the Benmer book. Um, I'll email you. I'll send you an email today and let you know what it is, rather than because I don't remember off the top of my head. I had it written down. I don't have it. Yes, we will go on to the next of the prophetic. We'll go to the to the minor prophets or the latter prophets. And so I'll send you an email today to let you know what that is. Thanks, folks. Thank you. God bless you all.